Oh, you need to activate the screen share. Sorry. Yep, should be good. Good. Uh, I guess fix this stuff. So you see my screen? Yeah. Sweet. Okay. Um, so let's talk about appendicitis. So it was kind of a unexpected talk, but it's you know it's prepared for for a long time. Um, so let me know if you have questions at the, any time. Now I can actually see your faces, so it's good. Um, so you know me all, so Lori, I work at the Jewish, and I'm going to work in Valley Field in about an hour and 15 minutes from now. So I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare for the presentation. And in terms of the objective, today I want us to go over the three different techniques of finding the appendix for the diagnosis of appendicitis. Try to name some of the focus findings that are suggestive that you, your patient actually has an appendicitis. And also try to dis uh, describe how do you integrate that in your practice? Because honestly, I don't do focus for all my patients with suspicion of appendicitis. Um, I think it's a bit counterproductive. So when do you get your probe to try to diagnose it? Appendicitis. How do you do this? So, uh, step number one is, in theory, you want to get the highest frequency probe. Why? Because the appendix is a subtle structure. And with the big curvy linear probe, you might not be able to appreciate what we're looking for in terms of the findings of appendicitis. Like any other disease where patients have pain, try to use a lot of gel to give you a good window so you don't have to push super hard. So the gel will kind of help you um, manage the fact that you need to compress a bit. So the linear probe is actually your go-to probe if you look for the appendix. However, the reality is a little bit different. Most of our patients are actually on the other side of the spectrum, so a little bit more towards the right of the screen, where uh, the linear probe is definitely not gonna be able to, you're not gonna see anything, you're just gonna see the abdominal wall muscles and then that's gonna be it. So I would say that when you're looking for an appendix, use this in people that you think you might be able to find it. So those with a little bit um, lower BMI, those who have, let's say, a lot of subcutaneous uh, tissue or a lot of adipose tissue, don't, um, lose your time there. You can try to find an alternate cause, but it's not the time for you to get your linear probe and really try to fish for that appendix. So just a word of caution. In those patients though, if you really wanna try and you're, I don't know, you're working in Wakefield and there's no way you can get a CT scan and then that's gonna make the decision for you to transfer the patient or not and you still wanna give it a go because you have time. Well, the, the patients with them who are a little bit, um, have a little bit more weight, then try to use the curvilinear probe. It's exactly the same technique. And again, generous amount of gel. The technique is very simple. Just like the small bowel obstruction, and I'm sure you guys have tried it before, you wanna do what we call a graded compression. So this is the belly, and you're gonna to try to put some pressure. Why? Putting the pressure will basically compress the gas and remove it out of your way. So you can actually see the structures underneath. And we're going to discuss this because we need some landmarks before we start fishing. Because as you know, bowel gas looks like nothing. It's just a big mess full of air. So the technique is going to be a graded compression where you want to compress the gas and you want to mow the lawn. So you're going to do some fishing, um, just like small bowel obstruction. Okay, so let's go into the three techniques I want us to dis discuss a little bit more in detail today. The first technique is at the landmarks. And actually, that's the most reliable one. So in every patient, you're going to be able to do that one. The follow the cecum is for from, it's more for the fellows, uh, the fellows in focus, but also the experts, because it takes a lot of skills to actually follow the cecum all the way down to where you think the appendix might, uh, might insert. Yes, it's still a good technique to try. And then the area of maximal tenderness, my per personal favorite, and I think this is uh, so something you should have in your pocket. So let's go over the landmark technique. So the landmark technique is super easy. You want to start in the right lower quadrant, and you're going to place your probe in transverse. So transverse is like this. You're going to find the iliac crest. So everybody, you can touch your um, ASIS, and uh, you're basically going to put the probe a little bit more medial to that. And the image you're going to get, on, you can appreciate on the screen, right under the probe marker, the green spot, is going to be your iliac crest. Once you have the iliac crest, you're going to find some other um, uh, structures that might be um, uh, ring a bell the psoas muscle. So this is the psoas muscle that we can identify right here, okay? And the iliac vessels. 
So you're actually quite deep in the pelvis, right? You're not next to the belly button. You're a little bit lower than that. So you're going to find iliac, psoas, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, so iliac uh, bone, psoas muscle, and iliac vessel. And the appendix will often lie in that area, right above the psoas, right next to the iliac vessels. Honestly, I've never seen an appendix that was actually lying on the other side, so medially to the iliac vessels. It's usually going to lie laterally or just above. And I have a baby cat trying to jump on me. Okay, good. Stay down. Um, yes, so the appendix is actually going to be in that area. That's why, if you remember your medical school, we do the psoas sign and we do, you know, the leg crossed and then you're trying to elicit pain on extension. That's because the appendix is supposed to lie around in that psoas. So in theory, when you uh, contract that muscle, you're going to irritate the appendix and create that psoas sign. Now it makes all sense, right? Remember the anatomy. The problem with the landmark is that the appendix can lie anywhere. So that's a beautiful picture of a cecum. So that is actually the cecum all the way down. And then the appendix can take off anywhere. It can take up a little bit more superior, inferior, lateral, me, uh, lateral, medial, and then retrotical, where there's no way you're going to be able to find it, honestly, with ultrasound. So this is why you need some other techniques. And this is where the follow the cecum technique come in. So in theory, if you really follow the cecum very well, all the way down to its distal end, you're going to be able to find the appendix. The way you're going to do that, you're going to start in the right upper quadrant with your probe in longitudinal, just like you do a fast exam. And then what you're going to do, you're going to slowly go down until you find that dirty gas. The dirt, you know, when you see small bowel, the small bowel has this nice linear pattern of air. It looks like A-line, just like you would see with um, when you do a pneumothorax evaluation. So a clean pattern of gas. When you get to the colon or the large bowel, it's dirty. It looks like a mess, just like on the screen. It's like speckles and gray and black and white. This is, this is large bowel. So you're going to find the large bowel, similarly to when you do your paracolic gutter um, uh, scan for small bowel obstruction, and you're going to move uh, so caud um, yeah, caudally. So you're going to move down really slowly, always following that dirty gas, until all of a sudden, the dirty gas is kind of tapering down in a round, um, in a round shape. And this is where you're actually going to be. So you're going to see dirty gas, dirty gas, dirty gas, dirty gas. Oh, it looks like it's turning. And then all of a sudden, it's not dirty gas anymore because here you're going to follow a lot of loops of small bowel. When you see that, you go back up a little bit. And this is where you start scanning a little bit more um, like this. You're going to go a lot of, um, mow the lawn until you find that little taper zone where you're going to see um, dirty gas and then something that looks tubular that is the appendix. Okay, so you start in a right upper quadrant, you move down, probe in longitudinal, you identify the large bowel, which is dirty gas, you follow the bowel down until you see that tapering, and then you try to find the appendix. This is an example. So we followed this, so this is cecum, it was dirty gas, you can still see that there's a lot of shadow, and whoop, all of a sudden, you see that little tubular structure that is a blind pouch, which is something we're going to talk a bit later. And you can see underneath there's actually the psoas muscle. So anatomically, it still makes sense, but you're kind of using a different technique to find it. And again, I know that sounds like, okay, that is a bit complex. I agree. It's actually something you really need to practice and have very good dexterity to really be able to follow this. Yet it's a good tool in your pocket. Let's talk about my personal favorite. So this is, I love to do this. I say, okay, I want you to take one finger, Show me where the most pain is. And then you ask them to point at the uh, area of maximal tenderness. And this is where you put your probe. And honestly, very often you're going to actually find something. Um, and this is where you look for the appendix. Okay, so let's talk about what does a normal appendix look like. Okay, so we just talked about the dirty um, bowel, dirty gas. That's actually what it looks like. I don't know if you can appreciate, but it's like speckles, right? It doesn't look like linear A-line pattern. This is the cecum. So the cecum comes in and then tapers into a little mini pouch right here that is the appendix. And again, you can appreciate that this is the iliac vein. So anatomically, it's exactly where you would expect to find it. And you can actually use both techniques here. So follow the cecum and the landmark technique. This is a normal appendix, so it's very thin. And I'm going to stop here just to describe where do you measure when you decide to measure for appendicitis. So I'm going to bring you back again to anatomy 101 of the bowel. You can appreciate here that there's an outer, uh, I'm sorry, so there's an inner dark layer. That is the mucosa, the mucosa of the bowel. And then you have a brighter 
layer right above it. That is the submucosa, and it's usually bright. And then right above this, you have the muscularis propria and the serosa. They're tightly together. So the appendix has three layers, and the bowel has three layers. And you really have to measure from outer dark wall to outer dark wall. Don't mis do the mistakes of measuring inside because um, this is the whole structure. So the darker layer is part of your appendix calculation and part of your appendix itself. Very good. So this is a normal appendix. Uh, appendix sorry. This is another video. This is actually a video of another normal appendix. Again, look at that dirty gas here. Great example. Speckled, there's a lot of artifact, and it tapers down into a very nice little tin tubular structure right above the iliac vessels. Very nice. Normal appendix. Another example, and now we can actually appreciate, I don't know if you can see, but this, the uh, iliac vessels are now in longitudinal, right? Instead of being in transverse, now they're tubular, so we know that we're in longitudinal. And at that point here, the appendix is going to look like a circle. And remember that image of the sacrum in different position of the appendix, it's not always going to look round. Sometimes it's going to be a tube, sometimes it's going to be round, depending on where you catch it and how it's positioned. So normal appendix, appendix that is really subtle though. Okay, what does an appendicitis look like? An appendicitis look like the appendix we just saw, but they look thicker, right? Look how you, we can appreciate now that the layers, especially the inner um, um, mucosa is actually quite thick, um, but also the submucosa. And this is where you would basically measure it. So the other dark wall to the other dark wall. This is example of appendicitis where it's thick um, and clearly different from the others that we just saw. And that's the same appendicitis, but in transverse, where you catch, it almost looks like a little target sign, right? And we can see that there's actually some um, infiltration, uh, infiltration of the fat surrounding it, but that's a little bit uh, more advanced. And again, appreciate the iliac vessels. So, so here, I'm, if you ask the patient, huh? So I was just gonna ask, so can you point out with your mouse where you would measure from on the specific image? Yes, so let me just freeze it. Good, so I'm gonna measure from here all the way down to here. Okay, thanks. Or like from here to here. It's quite thick. And that's tough again, because there's a lot of fat stranding around it. But this is clearly um, uh, enlarged. And if I would to take the measure now, I can't measure, but it's almost like a centimeter. And we're actually coming to the criteria. Oh, what a great way to introduce this. So what are the criteria for you to diagnose an appendicitis? Criteria number one, it has to be a blind pouch. Don't get fooled because in the area of the right lower quadrant, you get some of small bowel loops. Small bowel loops, they will look tubular structure, quite thin, but they won't have a blind pouch. They won't end. They keep going, right? There's tons of it. So you really have to be patient to really try to see if it really is a blind pouch. Once you realize that it really looks like it's a blind pouch, there's no continuum. Um, the other criteria in size is actually to have it more than six millimeter in diameter. So it has to be a little bit thick. Most of them, they're going to be about a centimeter. It's going to be quite obvious. And the subtle ones, and I'm sure you've seen on a CT scan where they mention, well, the tip of the appendix is actually seven millimeter, but the rest looks less than six. So it's indeterminate. So they use the same criteria for the CT scan. So more than six millimeter is what you're looking for in a blind pouch and has to be non-compressible. Because sometimes it will actually be a little bit thick. Let's say you have an ileitis and you actually think it's a blind pouch, but it's not. Or you're like, oh, wow, it's more than six millimeter. But then it's going to be compressible. An ileitis is just going to be thick in bowel, but then when you press on it, it's actually going to collapse. The appendix won't collapse. So it's non-compressible. Again, similar to the small bowel obstruction technique. So blind pouch, more than six millimeter in diameter, non-compressible, and there will be no perispalsis. That's the also important point to distinguish between a, a loop of small bowel. You have to be patient, you compress, you stay there, and you look. And if you, what you thought was the appendix starts moving and doing some perispalsis movement, well, that's not the appendix. The appendix doesn't do perispalsis. It's actually just a fixed structure, not like the small bowel. Okay. So this is an example of a blind pouch, right? You're gonna scan it and you really realize by scanning it from side to side, up and down, that it really is that blind pouch. You're gonna measure it, again, from the dark outer wall to the dark outer wall, and that is definitely more than, um, it's actually seven uh, millimeters. So this one is actually subtle, but you know clinically that's an appendicitis. 
And again, outer wall to outer wall, the dark to the dark. And it has to be non-compressible. So here I am, look at this, compressing, and I'm not letting go. I'm being very, very patient and I'm gonna compress and I'm gonna look, is there a peristalsis? That's the structure, sorry. I'm pointing with my finger, you know, right there. Um, so this is the appendix or appendicitis and I'm compressing and I see that there's absolutely no peristalsis. Again, realize this is the iliac bone. You're gonna have your psoas here and your iliac vessels are in that area because you can see some pulsation right there. Pulsation, so you know that there's some iliac vessels in that area. So beautiful example of appendicitis, non-compressible. And again, be patient. Um, this is actually uh, something that I did at the children, just starting, I was like being junior, I don't even know the date, uh, but that is a big appendicitis right there. And there's no peristalsis. I'm really looking, and you can see here, these are small bowel loops up there. That's a little bit different, right? And you see that there's some air in it, and if you were to wait a bit, you would see that they are moving while this structure is not, and that's the appendix. So these are the criteria. Blind pouch, again, I remind them, uh, blind pouch, more than six millimeter in diameter, uh, non-compressible and no peristalsis. But there are some other findings that sometimes will kind of help you to really confirm that this is what it is. I love this. So the ring of fire. So if you put some Doppler flow, so you put on, you put on your color, you know the color flow, you just take the box right above what you think could be the appendix uh, or appendicitis, and then this is what you're looking at. So you can see how there's a ring of fire so your submucosa is actually lighting up, just like a ring of fire. That is a sign of appendicitis. It's a supportive sign. It's not a diagnostic criteria. Other signs, sometimes you're going to be able to appreciate a very thickened appendix, right? You can tell the wall looks angry. And here you have the appendicolis, just like the gallbladder stone that you can appreciate in the gall, uh, the gallstone in the gallbladder. Here you have a little stone or a little appendicolis in the appendix that's definitely causing the obstruction and, and the, the pathology giving you that shadow. Another sign suggestive of appendicitis. Um, sometimes also I didn't include it here, but you're gonna have in the right lower quadrant some free fluid, just a tiny bit of free fluid next to your iliac vessels in that area. And that is usually a supportive sign of this, but it's not uh, perfect because sometimes you'll get this because you have, um, I don't know, some other pathology that we're actually gonna discuss right now. So let's integrate it together, okay? so. Um, you're working in a merge shift, and then you have someone coming in with right lower quadrant pain. You put your probe uh, at the X area of maximal tenderness, and what do we see here? That's actually quite easy because I showed that picture a few times. So it looks like an appendix, an inflamed appendix, appendix. And you think it's appendicitis. You stop, you do your measurement, it looks angry, it's non compressible, blind pouch, no peristalsis, it's definitely more than six millimeter, you're done. Uh, this is appendicitis. Um, but then what do, you do, what do you do with this? So depending on where you work, very rarely a surgeon will say, I believe you. Let's bring that patient to OR. It will happen in kids. It will happen when, in smaller centers when you show them your image and you have a perfect thing. And it's usually when you have a male patient. Because in female patients, there are other things that could fool you that looks like this. Sometimes hydrosalpine skin looks like this. Um, some, in a variant pathology. And most people would want to have a, a bit more of a formal a thing. But for me, as I always say with POCUS, um, I will kind of put that patient, uh, I remove my cognitive load of diagnosis from that patient. I know what she has or what he has. I can pretty much certify that this person has an appendicitis. So I'm going to give him some analgesia. I'm going to wait for the formal ultrasound in the morning or the radiology performed ultrasound, should I say, um, in the morning. And I'm going to just put them in PO. So right away, he's kind of in the box. Uh, for me, I don't need to pursue any advanced um, imaging right now. I know the disposition of that patient. Um, yeah, so it, depending on where you work, it's going to be a little bit different in terms of the management. Another patient, white lower quadrant pain, uh, a little bit more sub uh, adipose tissue, as you can appreciate on there, uh, up there. And I'm um, sorry, my, uh, my screen, let's say my screen is flipped. Um, so you're putting your probe and then you're looking for those iliac vessels when you're not sure of the anatomy. And then you notice it. So this is bladder, if I can remind around you. And here I'm trying to look at the, uh, the uterus, but then I have this uh, structure right here. So what can it be? Could be pregnancy, right? 
That's one of the things that is in, in your differential, the right lower quadrant frame. Could that be an ectopic? So let's say that's the right lower quadrant. I'm not sure why it's flipped. Uh, yeah, so that could be an ectopic pregnancy. This is actually a good example. I actually thought that was an ectopic pregnancy, but that's not. That's actually a, a, an a, a ovarian cyst, so a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. And that's just to um, uh, illustrate that sometimes when you get the probe and you think, okay, I'm going to look for the appendix, you know, I have some time. Well, sometimes it's going to pay off because you're going to find an alternate diagnosis. All of a sudden, you're not going to scan that patient. You pretty much know what she has. You probably know, and you're going to get a pelvic ultrasound in an elective way. Maybe a day later, you can send her home or monitor her, uh, her if you find some free fluid and the hemoglobin is dropping. So all of a sudden, focus just change your, your, your management for that patient. So in your differential, sometimes you'll find something else. Hemorrhagic ovarian cyst is the example here. And then sometimes you'll find this, right? You're like, uh oh, this is a live intrauterine pregnancy where you have your bladder, your uterus, and a little baby with a fetal heart rate. That's a nice surprise. Live IUP. And sometimes as you're doing your graded compression in the right lower groin, you're going to find this. And uh, I don't think we did the presentation this year yet, and I'm pretty sure we're going to be talking about this, but this is a great example of small bowel obstruction. So this is a dilated loop of small bowel that is non-compressible with no peristalsis. So although it looks like an appendix, it's actually quite bigger. Uh, it's about uh, two centimeters, right? you can appreciate right here. And sometimes that's what you're going to find. And then the patient tells you, oh, it's true, I've had two surgeries before, gallbladder and appendix, or gallbladder and something else. And then uh, here you go with your diagnosis of small bowel obstruction, uh, not expecting to find it, but then you're, now you know, and your cognitive log again is out of your mind, you kind of have your diagnosis for that patient. And that's pretty much it. So some take home messages for you today in terms of appendix. Um, I know it can look difficult. This is a bit more of an advanced topic, okay? But it's still cool to know about it and still cool that one day you will try it and you'll find the appendix and you'll be so happy and it's gonna make you feel great. I think focus for appendicitis is feasible and useful. You have to have an approach. So remember those three techniques that we talk about and remind, uh, remember that you wanna to try to use it in people when you think it's gonna make a difference, right? Not the one you're gonna be looking for for like 15 minutes. You don't have that much time. Um, the other thing is think, think of it as just part of an evaluation uh, extension of your physical examination. Again, with a, with a question, always you have to have a question for your ultrasound. Pain in the right lower quadrant, let's look to see if there's an appendix. And then sometimes you will find an alternate diagnosis. That's going to be very useful for you in your practice and your flow. I want you I to try, uh, all to try it on your next patient with suspicion of appendicitis, okay? I think it's really good and it's, it's something that you can do. Remember those little tips and um, I can try to send you, I have a little summary of uh, all the criteria that you, you can look at in case you don't really remember uh, them because we don't do it as commonly as some other um, uh, focus um, indications. So I'm gonna take any questions you might have. We're on time. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see you. Are you guys still there? It's always my biggest nightmare. You know, you're just talking for 20 minutes and then you're disconnected offline. <laughs> Definitely still here. Can you just show, like, um, you were kind of doing it with your hand, but so just so I understand the scanning technique, can you just show with your hand what you were doing, like where you usually start if you're not doing the, like where the pain this. is the worst? Uh, so you mean the cecum? Yeah, so you really you start all the way up at the top and then yeah. you down? So you basically take your probe, and now you're going to see my juggings. Yes, I'm wearing juggings. <laughs> uh, so you basically take your probe right here, and you're going to just go down like this, follow the cecum, all the way down to the iliac bone. And this is usually where your cecum is really going to kind of become round a little bit, and this is where your appendix is supposed to take off anatomically. So you do like a fast, so I don't even have anything. Oh, yeah, my phone. So that's the probe. You take the probe and you're going to go just like a fast. So right here, we're in the red upper quadrant. And you're going to slowly slide down like this until you hit the about the iliac crest. And this is really where it's going to taper and become. And honestly, you really have to do it yourself. You're really going to see that you're, you're following the dirty gas. And all of a sudden, you're like, hey, it's not dirty gas anymore. You're going to see the iliac crest. You're going to see some other structure. And this is where once you're down, so you're like, okay, oh, I'm touching the iliac crest. There's some dirty gas that I can appreciate here. And you're going to do up and down like this. 
and you're gonna move down like this and you're gonna start seeing some other definition. So the small bowel is gonna kick in. The ilium, ilium is there, right? This is the cecum becomes the, um, the ilium becomes the cecum and this is the iliotical area. This is where your appendix is in theory. But you have to kind of try it for yourself to really understand it. If you don't find your appendix on a thin person. That is a great question, uh, Rebecca. So I don't know why. In uh, I have to be politically correct, right? Because this is recorded. Uh, but in academic centers, there is this mentality of just sending everyone to CT. And uh, sending everyone to CT with oral contrast uh, for appendicitis. And um, if you look at the literature, and Mustafa and Noel looked at this, um, there's a lot of centers who don't do uh, um, drinking, so uh, oral contrast for many of the bowel pathologies. Um, and you can imagine when you have a, I don't know, um, a small bowel obstruction that you're not going to be able to drink much to coat your bowel, um, whatever. So there's, there's this big mentality of CT in academic centers. Well, let's say I work in Valleyfield you're not gonna scan a patient first. You, you, most of the thin patients, you're just gonna send them for an ultrasound. Let's say I don't find it, I'm gonna request the ultrasound for the morning by the, radi uh, the radiologist. And that's gonna be the step. And that's, sh that's the step that we were always taught in textbooks. Uh, we're moving, we're really moving towards the CT. Um, I find as a Jewish or when I was a resident in other places. Well, remember in PEDS, you would really never really start with the CT first, right? because it's radiation, it's a more expensive test. There's a uh, possibility of allergies to contrast. So this is something you wanna to try to avoid. And I would say that it's still completely okay to request an ultrasound in a thin person. But again, remember that an obese patient, uh, the radiologist is gonna struggle as much as you to try to find the appendix. So that might be the indication where you would move to something else such as a, a CT scan. But it's a good question. And I would still argue that the ultrasound has its place in the diagnosis of appendicitis. Uh, can you comment on retrocycle appendix and pokes? Oh, so, so tough. Really, really tough. This is where your, um, your uh, follow the cecum technique works kind of well, because uh, sometimes you will be able to appreciate where it's coming. But then again, if it's lying behind the cecum, the only thing you're going to have is dirty gas. And then you're really going to blind your view uh, of the appendix because of that, uh, of that dirty gas. So this is one of the pitfalls of the uh, pokes for appendicitis is that retrocycle is going to be really, really tough. 